Awesome. So a lot of the presentations so far have been about the future of Bitcoin, about the future of cryptocurrency, and about where we're going. I think that's important, but I also think the past is important too. So my presentation is really about remembering. I want to start off with a quote about a very influential, or from a very influential person. And what she said was, Bitcoin was conceived as a vehicle for, for creating social change and political change by empowering the individual and by weakening the government. This is by Wendy McElroy, who is an individualist anarchist and an individualist feminist. And this quote is from her serialized book that actually appears on Bitcoin.com. So if anybody wants to read it, they have access to it. Now this quote is important for several reasons. It's because she's looking back on the past of Bitcoin and cryptocurrency, the things that foreshadowed Bitcoin and cryptocurrency, and that was early encryption and the cypherpunk movement, which we're going to talk more about, which I'm going to dive into. Now, in her quote, she says it's about creating social change and weakening government. This is a crypto anarchist statement. And first, I want to focus on this term, anarchism, so I can be really clear with you guys, so we can all get on the same wavelength as far as the terminology. So what is anarchism? You might immediately think, oh, anarchism is just madness and chaos and bombs in the streets and men wearing leotards with mohawks driving down the road and getting ready to toss a Molotov cocktail into grandmother's window. I have some news, that's not what anarchism is. Anarchism just means without rulers. It means without masters, without tyrants. It comes from the Greek term, an, meaning without, and arkos, meaning chief or ruler, so literally without rulers. The modern day anarchist is a person who believes in peace, who believes in freedom, who believes in autonomy, who believes in independent thinking, as Daniel was just up here talking about. That is what an anarchist is. And I want to dive into two particular branches of anarchism that a lot of the people at this conference would be able to identify with or already identify with. So the first term in regards to this philosophy is referred to as voluntarism. So voluntarism just means that an individual wants their interactions with other human beings to be as consensual as possible so that there's not force or not coercion involved in those interactions, right? And this is the keystone of cryptocurrency and Bitcoin. When we trade with these cryptocurrencies, we are trading in a consensual manner with other human beings, and there's no de facto coercion involved in these exchanges. So it's very important. Another piece of the puzzle when it comes to these, these philosophies of anarchism, and it's one that probably even more people here represent with, is called anarcho-capitalism. Anarcho-capitalism is a philosophy that was sort of the brainchild of Murray Rothbard. Who in here, here is familiar with Murray Rothbard? Okay, several hands. So Murray Rothbard had this idea, and it was developed from other ideas prior to him coming into the, into the foray of anarchism. But anarcho-capitalism is just this idea that self-ownership is of utmost importance. And if we control ourselves, that means that any kind of action that involves violence against us is a moral wrong. But Rothbard and the anarcho-capitalists took this idea a step further. And what they suggested was that if they own themselves, then they also own the fruits of their labor. So this idea of property, property is an extension of the self, it's an extension of self-ownership. So this means people should be able to use capital, own the means to the production, and develop societal infrastructure, develop products like a lot of people in this room are probably involved in 
right now. And they should be able to do that without men with guns and men wanting to do violence against them to get in the way. And I know, what does this have to do directly with Bitcoin and cryptocurrency? And we're going to talk about this now because these ideas, these anarcho-capitalist and voluntarist ideas are embedded deeply into the cryptocurrency ecosystem. It's all part of our birthright, part of our heritage, and it's a beautiful thing to be proud of, and we all have to absolutely be proud of it. So this is going to be a really in-depth discussion. There's going to be a lot of names that I bring up, and there's going to be a lot of different ideas here. So feel free to take notes or to keep track of any name that I mention or any idea that I mention. I would be glad at the end of this to answer questions on those particular ideas because it's really detailed. So very early on, before Bitcoin and before cryptocurrency arrived on the scene, there were people working in an arcane area of mathematics called cryptography. And in 1975, an individual by the name of Whitfield Diffie created what we now call public key cryptography. Who here is familiar with public key cryptography? So Bitcoin would not be possible, cryptocurrency would not really be possible if we didn't have public key cryptography, the ability to encipher numbers, to encipher data and send it to another people uh, or other people for them to descramble and to read without anybody else getting involved in that transaction. An interesting thing happened. After Diffie came out with public key cryptography, it really opened the floodgates or let the genie out of the bottle in regards to cryptography. And it allowed a bunch of different people in the public to start developing new ideas alongside this idea. So RSA was created, elliptical curve cryptography was created. And the really fascinating part of this whole story to me is as soon as it happened, all these people got involved. And the reason they did that is because prior to this, the NSA and the government had a monopoly on cryptography. They had a monopoly on this field of study, and it was only useful for academicians and people in the ivory tower and these walled gardens that nobody could penetrate. But now free people, private people, mathematicians, iconoclasts, and different people could get involved with cryptocurrency. So it's what brought us to the point that we're at today, these individuals developing these cryptographic systems very early on. And I'm going to come back to the story about the NSA and about the government in regards to these cryptocurrencies and a battle that the cypherpunks had to fight with these guys to allow more access to cryptography, more access to these, even these currencies that we're using today. So right after the creation of cryptography, and pu specifically public key cryptography, in the late 80s and early 90s, a group sprung up that referred to themselves as the cypherpunks, and they, they cropped up it was in the Bay Area in San Francisco, also in Palo Alto, various groups existed, but they created what is we now call the list or the cypherpunk mailing list, where they started communicating radical ideas about using cryptography, steganography, different forms of remailers and other aspects of cryptography for and bear this in mind, it's very important, for the purpose of making the state obsolete, for the purpose of bypassing governments, getting beyond governments, and getting outside the scope of all of the bureaucracy that chokes us out and makes it very difficult for us to innovate because men with guns are constantly looming over us. Now, the term cypherpunk, how did that, where did that actually come from? There was a woman in the group in this early group of cryptographers. Her name was Jude Milhan. And she saw the guys sitting around in a circle and she said, you guys are just a bunch of cypherpunks. So what she did was mix the term cyberpunk, just added cypher with the English or the British spelling cypherpunk. And of course it made sense because the cyberpunk was already a genre of science fiction that all of these guys were really big fans of because it talked about the issues that we're interested in, privacy, anonymity, security, and those kind of things. So cypherpunk worked out really well as a term, and it stuck. And the other two 
primary individuals in this movement. You may have heard of them before. It's Timothy Mays or Timothy May and Eric Hughes. Timothy May is a central figure in this cypherpunk tale. By the way, you can get some of this information. My buddy Jamie Redman is over here, and he wrote a story on Bitcoin.com called The Cypherpunk Tale, and he told this specific aspect of the story. And Timothy May coined the term crypto-anarchist. And think back about what we talked about with anarchism. Timothy May was heavily influenced by anarcho-capitalism, by Murray Rothbard, by Ayn Rand. He read all of these early individuals. So it was his idea to say, let's use cryptography to get beyond the government, to leverage anar anarcho-capitalism in the system at large. So he wrote what has now been known as the Crypto Anarchist Manifesto. And in this manifesto, he talked about these ideas. He talked about these technologies that are going to free us. And he actually presaged or foresaw the coming of cryptocurrency, the coming of Bitcoin. He talked about using remailers and other forms of email security before they were actually fully fleshed out. Because remember, this was in the early 90s. And this was right around the time of the mainstream adoption of the internet as it started to really kick into gear. The other individual who helped him and who ran the physical meetings in San Francisco in the Bay Area, his name was Eric Hughes. And Eric Hughes also wrote a ma manifesto called the Cypherpunk Manifesto. And his main concern was privacy, anonymity, using digital signatures for security, and also talking about where we're headed. So these guys were the early visionaries who were much like us, except now, instead of looking toward where the digital currencies, or excuse me, where the digital in encryption methods and cryptography may be going, now, of course, we're looking at where are we going with cryptocurrency? Where are we going with smart contracts? Where are we going with decentralization? And all of the other buzzwords that we hear on a regular basis. So it's... It was these guys who really pushed the envelope and pushed us into this next phase of existence for creating an anarcho-capitalist society, creating a freer society, and really winning the day. Now, I have one more story in regards to these guys and what they were able to accomplish. One of the founding members' name was John Gilmore. And John Gilmore did something really exciting. He wanted the NSA to release documents, specific documents, in regards to encryption, early encryption. The founder of American Cryptography, his name was William Friedman, and John Gilmore wanted to get his book, the founding book for the NSA, Cryptanalysis, released and declassified. Well, guess what? His buddy told him that document was actually available at the library as it was classified by the NSA. So his buddy Xeroxed him a copy, sent it to him, and then as soon as the government and the NSA found out that he had the, a copy of the book, they tried to say that he was in violation of the Espionage Act. And this was during the cypherpunk wars of the 90s when they were fighting the government for information. Well, the funny thing was, he had made, Gilmore had made copies of the book, hid them away, and put them to the side. And this, just because he thought he was going to be raided, but it's kind of funny because they were wanting to charge him with the Espionage Act for merely checking out a library book, essentially, for looking at a library book. Well, he brought it to the press, and the press started making commentary about this, so the NSA backed off, and they said, we're going to declassify it because there was too much light. So the cypherpunks won this war, this battle to completely and totally unleash cryptocurrency, or excuse me, cryptography, onto the masses. So really, the moral of the story here is that the cypherpunk movement anticipated Bitcoin, but they did not anticipate it for just a financial revolution. They did not in anticipate it just so we could innovate for the sake of innovation because of more convenience. They did this so we can get beyond having to deal with the state, so we can make this place that we live in a much more beautiful, a much more pleasant place. The reason that we're all in this conference right now, sitting in this room, is so we could get beyond the state, so we can continue innovating, so we continue moving into the future, because we don't need governments to take care of us. We don't need these individuals to help us. They squash innovation, and they cause us a myriad of problems. So let's not downplay this truth. Let's remember. Let's not forget. This is the importance 
of what we're doing. It's the importance of changing society and fomenting a grand paradigm shift. On that note, uh, we have just a couple minutes for questions, and then we'll take a little break and get our next speaker up. Does anybody have any questions? Nobody? Okay, we'll put your hands together. Thank you. Thank you.